Hi, I'm Shashank Bhargav and you're listening to Three Things, the Indian Express news show. On the show this week, we have been looking back at this year's biggest developments. So far, we have talked about the Indian economy and India's foreign relations. Today, we take a look at what 2022 has been like for the judicial system in India. And for this, joining us is Apurva Vishwanath, who writes on Law for the Indian Express. Apurva, a lot of major things happened this year as far as the judiciary is concerned. There were a number of notable judgments, cases that were heavily politicized, and we also saw three different chief justices. So we have a lot to talk about. But let's begin by talking about something historic that happened with the Supreme Court this year. And by that, I mean that the proceedings of the Supreme Court started to be live-streamed. Talk about how big of a deal that was. So, uh, Shashank, so far we've had a few high courts live-stream its proceedings. We have had Karnataka, Gujarat, and this was during COVID. But the Supreme Court, for the first time, live-telecasted its proceedings. And we had a bunch of constitutional cases which were watched. And on the first day, for example, the economically weaker section quota, that was the first constitutional case that was live telecast and there were about 80,000 views on the first day. It is a momentous occasion for the Supreme Court. People from across the country watching what's happening in court. It's still a long way to go. Right now, you only have constitution cases. That is where the bench sizes five or more judges that will be live telecast. But it's like an idea whose time has come and soon you'll have every court of the Supreme Court going live. But tell us, what difference does it make whether these proceedings are live-streamed or not? What is the big deal about the fact that now an average person can watch these proceedings online? You know, imagine a 10 by 10 gallery where maybe 20 or 30 people can stand at most jam-packed. When I say 20 or 30, that's each one of them is jostling for space. And this is mostly journalists and a few law clerks, interns and these people and some litigants as well. And these are the people who get to witness the biggest legal issues deliberated by the highest court of the country. And then suddenly this conversation opens up for millions who can watch from across the country. And that's a substantive difference because usually what happens in court is couched in very esoteric terms. There's a lot of legalese. One of the criticism is that it's not what a layman or what an ordinary citizen understands. But Live streaming changes that. They see what the judge is asking the lawyer. They see what arguments that the lawyer is making to defend these laws. And you also see the government explain why it brought about a particular legislation. At a time when you have very little debate happen in the parliament, watching the government do this in court, it's some sense of accountability for a citizen. So a lot of these things are happening for the first time in the country. Okay, so live streaming was one big change. It makes the apex court more accessible to people. But the other big thing, of course, was that this year, we saw three chief justices. We've seen Justice N.V. Ramana, who retired in August. Then there was Justice U.U. Lalit, who retired in November. And now we have Justice D.Y. Chandrachud. So talk a bit about the legacies of these justices and the changes that we saw into them. So towards the end of August, you had uh, Chief Justice U.U. Lalit take oath. Before that, so the Justice N.V. Ramana court was reeling off the COVID pandemic, managing this new shift to a virtual platform. And a lot of these issues dominated his tenure. And there was this constant criticism of the court that cases were in cold storage, cases were not being heard enough or, you know, important cases where the government is challenged that they are not being heard. So amidst all of this, Justice Yuyu Lalit took over. And he had a very short 74-day tenure, out of which about three weeks were vacation, you know, the Diwali and Dasara vacation. So he came in with a lot of expectations about what he will do in this very short tenure. And Justice Dalit is somebody who's been an advocate in practicing in the Supreme Court. Then he became an advocate on record who does the filing and appears before the Supreme Court. He became a senior advocate and then was directly elevated from the bar as a judge of the Supreme Court. So with this vast experience, he came setting his own targets, so to say, that he would wanted to bring in a lot of reform in the listing of cases. He acknowledged this problem that important cases are not being heard. And he said, he attributed most of that to COVID, but then he said, we will change this. So that 74-day tenure was essentially that blitzkrieg of changes in the Supreme Court. A lot of these legacy cases being heard, 
I mean, whatever you could do in that short tenure, right? But still, a lot of these important cases were listed, and one of the big decisions that came about in that tenure is actually live streaming of court proceedings. So all of this together, seventy-four days, it was tenure with a lot of activity, and then you had Justice Devi Chandrachud take over. I, Dhananjay Yashwant Chandrachud, having been appointed Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of India, having been appointed. As Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of India, do swear in the name of God. Do swear in the name of God that I will wear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of India as by law established. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of India as by law established. That I will uphold. The so Justice Devi Chandrachud has a tenure of about two years as Chief Justice of India. this is one of the longest tenures that we've seen in the past decade or so so this is a very crucial time with the general elections coming and you know a lot of pushback from the government as well on the judiciary so this tenure will be marked for how it responds to that and how it addresses some of the legacy problems of the judiciary and when you mention justice yu yu lalit i mean his tenure was just 74 days and that's a really short period and in the past as well we have seen short tenures of chief justices and this year again there was this whole conversation about what can be done about that so could you speak to some of those arguments in the favor of long tenures perhaps so you know the chief justice of india is appointed based on seniority the senior most judge of the supreme court is appointed the chief justice of india and this is conventionally how it's done but what this also brings about is varied tenures that is they retire a day before their 65th birthday so you've had chief justices with really short tenures and going forward we're going to see more of that but one suggestion that often comes in is to have a fixed tenure for chief justices of india so that's an idea that the judiciary has resisted and the idea is that the chief justice is only the head of the administrative court you know we have a polyvocal court that is the court sits in combinations of different benches and nobody is you know more important than the other in terms of seniority so there is this notion but of course the chief justice is the administrative head of the court that means he's the master of roster and decides the listing of cases so one thing that you hear from the judiciary is a lot of these processes are now being increasingly automated and takes away a lot of discretion from the chief justice of india himself so tenure of the cgi would not matter as much but figuratively he is the head of the institution and these are conversations that we've had time and again but for the process of continuity you know a most of big decisions are taken by the collegium when it comes to appointment for example they sit in combinations of 3 and 5 so the senior most judges make these decisions collectively so that ensures a level of continuity and the next one is usually taken into confidence so that the reforms don't suffer in the court and you mentioned the collegium and we'll talk about that a bit later but this year there were some other notable retirements as well former judges hemant gupta and ajay khanvilkar for example both of them heard some pretty notable cases so could you talk a bit about them and the cases they looked at yes we've seen a bunch of retirements of also this year justice nv ramana retired yu yu lalit retired but apart from the chief justices you've had uh, the big retirements just as hemant gupta who was the last person to have retired from the supreme court in october just as hemant gupta decided a bunch of cases which had some sweeping implications for the minorities in this country for example he was part of the two judge bench that delivered a split verdict in the hijab case which was an appeal of a decision by the karnataka high court which allowed the state government to ban wearing of a hijab in educational institutions so justice gupta said that the karnataka high court's decision was right and he upheld the ban on the hijab whereas justice sudhanshu dhulia who shared the bench with him disagreed and recorded his reasons so now that case will have to be heard by a larger three judge bench and justice gupta was also part of the bench which heard the another issue from karnataka which was about the celebration of ganesh chaturthi in the shahi eidga in the city so this was a case that was heard just a day before ganesh chaturthi and again it was a split verdict the same bench justice bulia and gupta justice gupta deciding in favor of the government where he said there is nothing wrong with celebrating ganesh chaturthi in the shahi eidga yeah both these cases are very contentious and have religious conflicts at the center of them absolutely 
But the Shahi Idga case, given how urgent it was to decide the issue, a three-judge bench sat on the same day and actually stayed the decision of the Karnataka government. So Justice Gupta's decision was sort of reversed by a larger three-judge bench. And when he retired, two months after his retirement, we see that he's been offered a, a post-retirement gig by the government. So now Justice Gupta heads the New Delhi International Arbitration Centre. So that's one development this year. The other big retirement has, of course, been Justice A.M. Khanvilkar. Justice Khanvilkar's legacy has been one that is largely where he gives the executive a benefit of doubt in issues when it comes to civil liberties and special legislations that curtail civil liberties. A string of judgments by Justice Khanvilkar have been in favor of the government, completely overwriting the rights of citizens for that matter. And would you say that was true for the case regarding the Prevention of Money Laundering Act as well? Yes, that was one of the last verdicts that he delivered before he retired. Three-judge bench that he headed upheld several provisions of the Prevention of Money Laundering Act, which gives sweeping powers to the state when it comes to raids, arrests and confiscation of property. But also one landmark judgment by Justice Khanvilkar is the now very often quoted Zahur Ahmad Shah Watali versus the National Investigative Agency, in which the judgment essentially makes granting bail in UAPA case virtually impossible. That's the ruling that a lot of high courts and lower courts cite to deny bail in UAPA cases. Of course, Justice Khanvilkar also delivered the judgment where he upheld amendments to the FCRA regulation. So uh, this is again another legislation where the amendments Justice Khanvilkar said were essentially conceived in the interest of public order. But these are amendments that largely curb foreign donations made to NGOs and other civil liberties organizations. Okay, so we're talking about PMLA, we're talking about UAPA, FCRA, which are a lot of acronyms. But these are all acts that opposition parties say can be and have been misused against them and even activists, right? Absolutely. But what is striking about these judgments is that when you read the verdicts, it is almost as if no questions are asked of the state. That every intention that the state says it has, has been taken at face value. So uh, that's the main criticism of these judgments that incidentally were all delivered by Justice Khanvilkar. But perhaps the biggest imprint on Justice Khanvilkar's legacy was the Tisa Sitalbad case. So this is, you know, while hearing a petition by the Gujarat rights victim, Zakia Jafri, where she's challenging the clean shit given by the SIT to then Gujarat Chief Minister Narendra Modi and everybody else in, accused in the case. So uh, while dismissing her petition, a bench of Justices Khanvilkar, Dinesh Maheshwari and C.T. Rabi Kumar said that the SIT probe had fully exposed the falsity of claims and made a reference to those who were apparently responsible for orchestrating these claims against the government. So this included Tisa Setalwad. So within a day, you had the government go after her and she was arrested and kept in jail. Now... Uh, action has been taken against activist Tista Setalwad. She has been detained. Remember only this morning an interview by Home Minister Amit Shah where he very openly named Tista Setalwad, uh, quoting that uh, Supreme Court judgment. She will be taken now to Ahmedabad for further questioning. But even as she was arrested there, she came out and said that her arrest is completely illegal. Expressing deep concern, Mary Lawler, the United Nations Special Repertoire on Human Rights Defenders, condemned the detention of activist Tista Setalwad on Saturday, saying defending human rights is not a crime. You know, and it took months for Tisa Setalwad to get bail. But the question uh, that everybody raised was really that whether the Supreme Court signaled to the government to initiate prosecution against Tista Setalwad and whether it was correct to do when Tista was not a party to that case at all. She was not involved in that particular petition at all. But eventually, during Justice Lalit's tenure, Tista did get bail. The Gujarat government and the center had opposed to the bail. But Justice Lalit granted her bail. So that was months later. Okay, and here we are talking about the Tista Setalwad case, but there were other cases also that dealt with matters of civil liberties. Cases that made a lot of news and were highly politicized. Siddiqui Kapan's case, for example, he was arrested under UAPA by the UP police and has been in jail for over two years now. So let's highlight some of those cases. 
So yes, I think when it comes to civil liberties, again, this complaint that bail cases were not being heard by the court, this was something that the court was cognizant of this year. So I think starting with Tisa Shaitalwad and also the case of Mohammad Zubair, co-founder of Alt News, who was arrested on you know very flimsy charges, so to say, he was granted bail by the Supreme Court. A bench headed by Justice Chandra Chud dictated the order in open court, despite objections by the UP government. And could you also remind our listeners why he was arrested in the first place? So uh, Zubair's arrest came based on a tweet of screenshot of a movie poster that he had put on Twitter, and an anonymous complaint was made, and there were several FIRs registered against him, and the UP police arrested him in that case. So of course, his phone and his laptop and other electronic devices were confiscated. And every time a magistrate would grant him bail in one case, he would be arrested in a similar FIR in another district, and they kept moving him from one jail to the other. His lawyers, Vrinda Grover and Sotik Banerjee, approached the Supreme Court, and a bench headed by Justice Chandrachud granted him bail. And the court sort of made these strong remarks about civil liberties and said that the state cannot take rule of law lightly. So after this rap on the knuckles, Zubair was released from the Tihar jail. That was a big bail decision that was given this year. We also saw Siddiqui Kapan get bail in the UAPA case, along with his other associates. So, but despite his bail in the UAPA case, Kapan was not released from jail. So the Allahabad High Court granted him bail in the other cases, in the ED case, just last week. But he's still not out of jail because you know his sureties have to be verified by the court, which is now on vacation. So he'll probably have to wait a little longer to be out of jail. But that was another case that was decided this year. You know, but we've also had cases in which bail was denied this year. Be it the case of Jyoti Jagdap, who was accused in the Elgar Parishad case in Bombay High Court. Or Umar Khalid, who in the Delhi High Court has been rejected bail for his alleged involvement in the Northeast Delhi riots case. We'll be back after this short message. Dear listeners, before we move forward with the show, a quick announcement: we will publish a special episode of Express Podcast on the Three Things feed on Saturday, thirty first December. In that episode, I, Charu Lata Biswas, will be in conversation with Geeti Seth. CEO SSE Nascom about Future Skills Prime, a digital skilling initiative that is a partnership between the government of India and Nascom, and how it can be your go-to platform for upskilling. Do remember to tune in on Saturday at 10 a.m. to listen to the episode. Now on with the show. Okay, so we have talked about the Zubair case, the Siddiqui Kapun case, and even the matter regarding the hijab case. But one major verdict that was delivered this year was related to the economically weaker section quota. A five-judge bench headed by Justice U. U. Lalit upheld the 103rd Amendment Act, which basically introduces a 10% quota for the economically weaker section. And this judgment triggered a lot of debate regarding the conception of reservation and its constitutional validity. So, could you talk about this verdict and the debate that it set off? So yeah, in terms of constitution bench judgments, the EWS quota was one of the big decisions that came from the court this year. Interestingly, this is a ruling in which the Chief Justice of India, who headed the bench, that is then Justice U. U. Lalit, he was part of the minority judgment. This is an unusual scenario because it's the senior most judge on the bench who usually rallies around everybody else in terms of how the verdict is delivered. But in this case, you had Justice Lalit and Justice Ravindra Bhatt, who were part of the dissent, that is a minority verdict, and three other judges upheld the judgment. So the fundamental question was whether quotas can be based on economic criteria alone, and this is something that the three judges who form part of the majority agree on. And they say that although historically reservations looked at a lot of factors. There is nothing wrong with the government addressing poverty alone as a criteria for giving out reservations. So, of course, this ruling has huge implications in how reservations are conceptually understood and uh, the history of reservations, really. And it talks to the social backwardness that the constitution, the framers of the constitution, tried to address through reservations as a tool. Right, because the historic or the original idea. Is that you're getting reservation because of the discrimination you're facing in society, the kind of discrimination that no matter what your economic background or economic circumstances are, you're still having to face. 
and reservation is supposed to protect you from that absolutely so if this is something that the minority judgment says justice ravindra bhat in his opinion writes that only economic criteria can be allowed as a tool for social upliftment but that can only come in the form of say tax breaks or access to public goods which could be subsidies or things like that but reservation in terms of public employment and education is something that is reserved for the socially and economically backward sections of the society that is what the constitution envisages and there can be no two ways about it this is something that the minority opinion says and you know the idea that it is conceivable that deletion of caste can happen that's something that the minority verdict grapples with and says as long as that exists you cannot take away social backwardness from the purview of reservations and apurva earlier you mentioned that there have been a couple of judgments this year that give a lot of benefit of the doubt to the government now on the other hand what we've seen this year is that the government has been attacking and criticizing the judiciary so yeah this year we've also been having this conversation about whether there will be a return of the national judicial appointments commission plan that was you know one of the first big projects that the modi government undertook when they came to power in 2014 the amendment which would give the government a foot in the door when it comes to appointment of judges was in fact struck down by the supreme court a five judge bench struck it down four is to one and after that the plan was sort of abandoned but now with the new found criticism that we've seen whether it is the law minister who is talking about the opaqueness and lack of public trust in the judiciary or uh, the vice president who said that it is not all over and the judiciary to must introspect whether they could sort of overturn the mandate of the parliament and this was a legislation that was passed with you know just one abstention every member in the parliament voted in favor of this amendment so jagdeep dhankar sort of mentioned that in his one of his first speeches and he also mentioned it in his maiden speech in the parliament the parliament in a much needed historic step passed the 99th constitutional amendment bill paving way for the national judicial commission this historic parliamentary mandate was undone by the supreme court by a majority of 4 is to 1 finding the same as not being in consonance with the judicially evolved doctrine of basic structure of the constitution honorable members there is no parallel in to such development in democratic history where a duly legitimized constitutional prescription has been judicially undone a glaring instance of so it CVR does give a sense of conversation about whether there is a return of the njac of course there, the judiciary did come back strong against it during a hearing in the supreme court on appointments itself justice sanjay kishan call who is part of the collegium and is now the second senior most judge in the court he did not take kindly to the comments made by the law minister and told the attorney general for india that it is not done so this new face off between the judiciary and the executive is something that's brewing towards the end of this year and some of the issues that the judiciary has been criticized about are not new the issue of pendency of cases or you know for that matter even court vacations right these are things that have often been discussed in the past and when it comes to these conversations about judiciary you see a rare non partisanship in the parliament as well cutting across party lines mps support these conversations so now we'll have to see whether this leads to something new and apurva you mentioned the law minister kiran rijiju he recently criticized the collegium system which we know is in charge of identifying judges for their appointment in high courts and the supreme court and he said that people are not happy with it and that there is a lot of opaqueness in the system and now what we have seen this past year is that the collegium recommends judges the government doesn't accept it and sends the recommendations back and usually what is supposed to happen is that the government can only send back names once and if the collegium still recommends them then the government has to accept it but that is not what we have been seeing so what are the implications of this happening and is it happening a lot more now 
So the understanding we have in law until this point is that according to the 1998 case, which is referred to as a third judge's case, that sort of formulated and cemented this collegium system of appointing judges. Is that once the collegium reiterates a name, that is, you know, they've made a recommendation, the government for whatever reason thought it was not fit for appointment, and has asked the collegium to reconsider. But after reconsidering, if the collegium reiterates the name. the government is bound to accept that recommendation this was the understanding that we've had so far but by and large you saw this uh, rule been taken very lightly in some cases by the government but there's been so much spotlight on it in the last few years and it is also now since 2017 that the collegium decisions are made public so we know who the collegium is recommending and you know whether the government is accepting or rejecting a particular recommendation before that the collegium recommendations were not available to public so it was only between the government and the collegium to sort of figure this out now that there is public glare on this information you see that there are names which the government is not appointing and there is also a sense that the collegium is not pushing back enough for example take the case of a uh, delhi high court senior advocate saurabh kirpal if appointed kirpal would probably be the first openly gay judge in india but the collegium has dragged its feet in recommending his name and even after the collegium has recommended the government has sent his name back the government does not want to appoint kirpal so these are some of the issues that are now coming into spotlight but the government's defense is that the collegium system itself is so opaque and not transparent and there are internal issues within the collegium itself which are not really untrue that criticism is to an extent fair So we've seen a lot of that happen this year. Okay so we have talked about a lot of cases related to civil liberties we have talked about the historic decision of live streaming the supreme court and notable retirements now what are the things that we can look forward to in the year 2023 I think the first big decision that is awaited is the supreme court's decision in the demonetization case which is expected on 2nd of January and after that i think you know a momentous year to look forward to you know some of the cases that are going to be carried forward from this year are for example uh, the karnataka hijab ruling right a larger three judge bench has to hear and decide this issue and also the bilkis bano case where the supreme court has to decide whether the remission granted to the convicts in the bilkis bano gang rape case is legally permissible and they have to decide on whether the gujarat government was right in granting remission so that's you know a decision that has to happen in 2023 apart from that there are several cases that we are looking forward to for resolution for example the electoral bonds case right that has to be heard and decided and there is also the case that everyone's looking forward to the appeal from the delhi high court in about same sex marriage so that's an idea which you know has now reached the supreme court and the court will have to decide this issue so there are quite a few judgments that you know are expected in 2023 but this will also be a year where the supreme court will be under much more spotlight because of justice chandrachud and you know how he handles the court and also the appointments that he has to make about a dozen appointments to the supreme court in his tenure so that will be something that you know will be watched very closely you are listening to three things by the indian express Today's show was written and produced by me Shashank Bhargav and was edited and mixed by Suresh Pawar. If you like the show then do subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts. You can also recommend the show to someone you think will like it, share it with a friend or someone in your family. It's the best way for people to get to know about us. You can tweet us at express podcast and write to us at podcast@indianexpress.com. At